OK, thank you very much. You can start. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Global and Mr. Kutu. Um, good day, students. Today um, I will be discussing study unit three, which deals with ownership. Please take note, as Professor Knobel said before, that um, the my discussion of this unit is not sufficient for you to go into the exams. You have to still master the study unit in its entirety um, in your own time. Right. So um, let us start by discussing the definition of ownership. Professor Knobel, is it possible whether you can move the slides, please? Thank you so much, Prof. Now, ownership can be defined as the most comprehensive real right that you can have with regard to your thing. So in principle, ownership means that you can act with your thing as you please. But it's important to take note that this freedom that you have with regard to your property is restricted. It is limited. It can be limited and restricted by the law and by the rights of others. So what is important for you to know is that ownership is not restricted. I mean, that ownership is not unlimited. Ownership is not absolute, meaning you can't do with your property as you please. Now, before moving on to discussing ownership, it's important to draw a distinction between ownership and limited real rights. Now, what is ownership? I've mentioned before that ownership is a real right with regard to your own thing, whereas limited real rights, an example of limited real rights would be a servitude, which is a right that you may have with regard to someone else's thing. For example, the a limited real right to use a right of way on your neighboring um, farmer's land, um, then you will have a limited real right over the farmer's land with regard to the usage of the right of way. Now, the entitlements of ownership, um, what does the entitlements of ownership entail? It, it entails using and enjoying your thing, enjoying the fruits of the thing, controlling the thing, consuming or destroying the thing. You can alienate the thing, you can even burden the thing, or you can vindicate the thing from somebody who is in possession of your, your, your property. Now, this is a diagram that basically illustrates how illustrates the limitations on ownership. And as I've mentioned before, the law can place restrictions on ownership as well as the right of other legal subjects. Statutory limitations can place an, um, an um, restriction on your, your, your property. We will see with the next example how that happens. With neighbor law, there are certain rules and regulations as to how you should go about and using your property. And then, as I've mentioned before, servitudes is an example of a limited real right. That also places a limitation on ownership. And then also third parties can have personal rights with regard to your property. And that will also place a limitation on ownership. The next PowerPoint slide will illustrate an example of how the law, statutory law, can place a limitation on your ownership. Now, Tim decides to develop a part of his farm, Highlands, as a residential township. But his attorney informs him that he that it is not possible to develop a part of the farm as a residential township because it appears that a regional development plan in terms of a physical planning scheme provides that the area is to be utilized for agricultural purposes only. Now, Tim approaches you for legal advice. Now, your advice to Tim would be that although Tim has the most comprehensive real right to his farm, he, in principle, he can do as he pleases with his farm. However, his ownership with regard to that farm and as to what he can do with regard to that farm is nevertheless restricted by legislation. We are dealing here with a limitation on ownership in terms of the law and more specifically in terms of a statutory measure. Therefore, Tim will not be able to develop a township on Highlands due to the legislation specifying that he is not entitled to do so. Now, another category that places limitations on ownership is neighbor law. Now, when you are the owner of a house and you live in a residential area, you must exercise your entitlements in respect of your land reasonably. 
And on the other hand, your neighbor must tolerate this um, usage of how you use your property within reasonable bounds. Now there are, what is nuisance? Before we move on to the two categories of nuisance. Nuisance refers to an unreasonable infringement of a neighbor's right. For example, nuisance in the narrow sense will occur where a neighbor's right of personality is infringed. For example, by if, if you um, emit sm um, poisonous gases or smelly gases on your, 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 your property, or if you are a very loud person making noise with a lot of music on your on your um, property, that can then um, infringe your neighbor's right of personality. So when so when someone is guilty of these um, contraventions, the remedy that can be instituted is a prohibitory interdict and or a claim for delictual compensation. Now, nuisance in the broad sense is where somebody actually the conduct of somebody results in damage to your property. And in that case, you will be able to also institute a prohibitory interdict and or a claim for delictual damages. Professor, you can move on to the next slide. Thank you. Can you see the next slide? No, Prof, I can't. <clears throat> and now? Um, I still can't see the next slide, Prof. OK, let me move on. Do you see it now? No, Professor. Hmm, that's strange. Do you see it now? Yes, I can see it. Thank you so much, Professor. OK. Now we are still dealing with neighbor law and what we will be focusing on next is lateral and surface support. Now, if you are the owner of land, you are entitled to support from your neighbor's land. You as an owner cannot make excavation excavations on your land, which will have the result of your neighbor's land subsiding. If you do uh, make excavations on your land with the result that your neighbor's land subsides, you who are responsible for the excavations will be liable for damage, even in the absence of fault. And then another category of neighbor law is encroachments. Where an owner encroaches on his neighbor, neighbor's land, for example, you build a structure on your land without knowing that it basically encroaches on your neighbor's land. In such a case, you, the owner um, affected by this encroachment can claim removal of the encroachment, or the owner can claim ejectment against payment of compensation for the enhancement of his property, or the owner can claim that the encroacher should take transfer of the land encroached upon and pay compensation. Please see in your textbook how compensation is determined. Then encroachments with regard to trees. Say, for example, you live next to your neighbor and the trees of your neighbor is planted close to the boundary to the extent that the branches encroaches upon your land. What you can do as the owner of your property, you can request that the owner remove the branches of the tree. If the owner refuses, you can approach the court for an order. If the roots or tree encroaches upon on your land, your neighbor's trees encroaches upon your land, you may remove the roots. Um, please take note that there is little authority on the question on whether the, whether a neighbor may compel the owner of the plants to do so with regard to plants. Then surface water. Every owner of land has to receive the natural flow of water from adjoining land. However, if the upper ten tenement owner, the, uh, the upper tenement owner may not interfere with the natural flow in a manner which is prejudicial to the lower tenement owner. If in the case of an urban tenement, the water should be diverted to the nearest street. If the water cannot be diverted to the nearest street, it should be diverted onto the lower tenement, provided that all reasonable precautions have been taken to avoid damages to the lower tenement. 
Please see Riedelang Heis versus Barzoni for the criteria to determine whether one is dealing with a rural tenement or an urban tenement. Now, party walls and fences. What is a party wall? A party wall is built on the boundary between two pieces of land in such a way that the land on which it stands belongs partly to the one owner and partly to your neighbour. Now, in terms of the common law, each owner has a servitude of lateral support, so the party wall may not be demolished without consent. Both owners are responsible for the maintenance of the wall unless one of the owners has abandoned his part of the wall. Now, owners should refrain from doing anything which could affect the stability of the wall. For the elimination of delicts uh, of danger, my apologies, the law of delict regulates this. Now, remember that if an owner, an owner has a duty to remove or eliminate dan dangerous situations on his property. For example, the storing of poisonous substances, the keeping of an aggressive um, dogs, etc. OK, so I've mentioned earlier that another an example of a limited real right is a servitude. Now, servitudes is a limited real right which restricts ownership. Now, an example would be a right of way or a mortgage bond. Say, for example, you are living next to an, uh, um, another farmer's land and the only way for you to enter town is to use a road over your neighbor's farm to enter town. Then you can register. Then you can register. Um, my apologies. Then you can register a servitude of right of way over the um, neighboring farmer's land. That will mean that you will have a limited real right over that property to use the owner's land, um, your neighbor's land, and your neighbor will just have to tolerate you using the land. Now, an example of personal a personal right. Remember, a personal right is different from a personal servitude, and a personal right is also different from from um. Yeah, yeah, no, my apologies from personal. Remember to draw the distinction between personal rights and personal servitudes. <coughs> Excuse me. A, an example of a personal right is where S has a contract with X in terms of which he may graze 100 head of cattle on X's farm. X does not have a servitude but has a personal right, but is this personal right is not as limiting as a limited real right because S will only be able to enforce the right against X and not against X successes in title, whereas in the case of a servitude, the um, X would then be S would then be entitled to uh, to enforce the right against X and X's owner and um, the successes in title of X. Thank you, and this concludes session three students. I will move Thank on. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kibitz. Okay, I'm going to share the slides for, sorry for uh, the slides um, of study unit four popping up there. I just wanted to check whether they are, um, I can access them and then of course they appeared on the screen momentarily. Sorry about that. No, so fine. I'm going to unshare and share again. Um, are you okay with continuing because it's, it sounded as if you have a, a sort of a scratch in the throat there. I have a cold since yesterday. I've oh, been shy. ill, so my voice is a bit um, hoarse, Prof. So I apologise for that. I am. I I will gladly present study unit four if you want. No, it's fine, Prof. If you want to, then it's fine. But I really don't mind. I'm in. Are you okay? Now. Are you okay? okay? Yes. I, I think am. you can you can do it in in the same way as you did now. Um, and then I will. As I said, I will try to wrap up a little bit and um, uh, also let me know if you if you don't think you can present the, the cases, I will also do that, but you prepared for them. So Thank you, I would like right, you to Prof. do it. OK, no problem, Prof. Okay, let me see.
Dr. Kiewicz, can you see the slides? I can, I can see the slide. Thank you so much, Prof. OK, students, so um, our next session, we will discuss original acquisition of ownership. And also, please take note, as I've mentioned before, you are still required to master the entire textbook and that this brief discussion will not be sufficient for you to write the exams. So please do um, master this study unit in your own time. Dr. Kiewicz? Yes, Prof. I see what I have opened here is what you've sent me, but it is a recording. Do you by any chance have the PowerPoint for study I unit do. three? Yes, I do have the PowerPoint then, slide, Prof. Then I think you should share yourself. I will do so, Professor. Um, You can send it to me if you want. Uh, OK, OK, Prof, I am just in the process of um, downloading it and saving it onto my computer so that I can um, share it on the screen. Um, if That's you could fine. just bear with me, students. OK, OK, I will be ready in a f minute or two, Professor. Okay. Prof. I see there's a hand, so I'm not yes, sure. Yes, I, I, I please yeah, want to. I'm, I'm just saying, please ask questions in the chat if you don't mind. That is what I wanted to address. Thank, Thank you. Much. Thank you, Mr. Kutu. Good day, colleagues. Can you see my PowerPoint slide? Yes, I can. If you can, um, I'm not, is it? Yes, yes I can, can see it and you can make it, you know how to make it the biggest size. Yes, I think that's fine. Yes, can, is, it, is it enlarged on your screens at the moment? It looks good. Okay, Thanks. Perfect. Okay, thank you, Professor and uh, Mr. Kutu. So um, it's important to distinguish between original acquisition and derivative methods of uh, um, acquiring ownership. Now, in this unit, we will be focusing specifically on original acquisition of ownership. So in the case of original acquisition of ownership, when ownership, um, when someone obtains ownership, it is without the co cooperation from a predecessor in title, whereas in the case of a derivative method of, of um, acquisition of ownership, ownership is transferred from one person to another. So remember, in the case of an original method, um, there is no cooperation from a predecessor in title. Um, so examples of original acquisition of ownership is appropriation, accession, manufacture, mixing and fusing, acquisition of fruits, expropriation, treasure trove, and acquisitive prescription. Now let's deal with appropriation as a form of an original method, uh, a method of original acquisition of ownership. So the requirements that need to be complied with for you to acquire ownership of a thing by means of appropriation is that you must have physical control of the thing. You must have the intention to become the owner of the thing. And the thing which you are laying claim on should not belong to anyone. So the nature and extent of the physical control is important. Mere holding of the thing is not enough. The control that you have must enable you to exercise the rights associated with ownership and an example that illustrates appropriation 
is in the case of Rick versus Moles. So what happened in Rick versus Moles was Moles was attempting to remove a large condenser from the Antipolis, which was a shipwreck abandoned by its owners. What Moles did was he tied a rope with a buoy to a large condenser in the engine room. Together with its attached pipes and contents, the condenser weighed about 63 tons. Rick and Hartman started to um, remember, so Moles uh, attached pipes and contents. Um, no, sorry, he um, tied a rope with a buoy to the large condenser. Then Rick and Hartman came along and they started to cut sections of the condenser loose to remove and sell them. So on appeal, the court Started. So the question was basically who became the owner of the large condenser? Was it Rick who tied a, a, a rope with a boy to the large condenser? Or was it Rick and Hartman who started to cut sections of the condenser? Now, in order to determine whether ownership has acquired, it's important to take into consideration the three prior the three requirements which I've mentioned before, namely that you must um you, you must um, have physical control of the thing. You must have the intention to become the owner and the thing must belong to no one. Now, in this case, Rick did not have physical control of the thing, whereas Rick and Hartman did. So at the end, the court de decided that Rick and Hartman were the owners of the, the, um, the, the large condenser because they had physical control, whereas Rick only... Um, he had a holding of the, the, the large condenser. So another example of a method of original acquisition of ownership is a session. Now a session takes place when an accessory thing becomes merged with a principal thing, with the result that the two things form one entity. So the accessory thing will lose its independence and will become part of the principal thing. The owner of the principal thing is the owner of the composite thing. So an example would be a painting, for example. Say, for example, you use a canvas belonging to someone else and you paint on the canvas. So who is now going to be the owner of the, 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 the canvas, the, the um, one who painted on it or the owner of the, the, the canvas? So the painter becomes the owner of the can canvas belonging to someone else that he painted on, but he will only become the owner of the canvas provided that the painting is more valuable than the canvas. And the same with writing on a piece of paper. If you write on someone else's paper, does the paper belong to the owner of the paper or the individual who wrote on the paper? So if a person writes on someone else's paper, the writer is the owner of the written piece. The owner of the written, of the, of the written piece the owner of the paper must be compensated for the paper. So we have now looked at the accession of movables to movables. Now we will be looking at the accession of movables to immovables. Now it's important to take note of the principle, the Roman Dutch law principle, superficies, solo said it. It stipulates that anything that is attached to land accedes to the land. This may take place either by means of planting and sowing or by building a structure on land. So if you plant and sow on someone else's land and the seeds take root on that of the land belonging to someone else, the owner of the soil becomes the owner of the plants and not you who have planted the, the plants on the other person's land. And the same with the building. If a movable thing becomes attached to land in such a manner that it, it loses its independence and forms a new entity with the land, the composite thing belongs to the owner of the land. Now, in order to determine whether the composite thing belongs to the owner of the land, you will have to look at the nature and purpose of the attached thing, the manner and degree of the attachment, and the intention of the person annexing it, annexing it. So, um, you in your study guide you will see that there are various cases referred to, the McDonald versus Raiden case, where the court formulated the traditional approach 
to ascertain whether a session has taken place. And these are the three factors that the court mentioned. Um, but for um, the, in your study guide, there is a, a further elaboration on, on these um, traditional approach that will assist you in determining whether the actual um, building um, or Yes, whether the building became part of the land. So another important case is the theatre investments case, which is also um, discussed in your study guide. And there the court reiterated that the intention of the annexer is the most important factor to consider and that the nature and purpose of the attachment and the degree of detachment are mere factors contributing in ascertaining the intention of the annexer. So please see your study guide in this regard. There are plenty of examples that illustrates the accession of movables to immovables. With regard to the acquisition of fruits, acquisition of ownership of fruits takes place by means of separation or gathering. So before separating the fruits from the tree, fruits are accessories of the principal thing and therefore the principal, the, the property of the owner of the principal thing. When the fruit is separated from the principal thing, the fruits becomes independent things, which as such can form the objects of ownership and become susceptible to an acquisition of ownership. Please see your study guide for the distinction between natural fruits and civil fruit. fruits. Manufacture, also known as specificatio. Now, an ownership is acquired by the unauthorized production of a completely new thing using a thing belonging to another. So, for example, a person making wine from another person's grapes or oil from another person's olives. So when a person makes a new product from material that belongs wholly or in part to another person, as in this example, say, for example, you make wine from someone else's grapes and you make oil from someone else's olives, who becomes the owner of the end product? The manufacturing, um, the manufacturing process must irretrievably alter the thing that is used, and this combination must give rise to a new product. So the material used in the manufacturing pr process must not belong to the maker, and there must be no agreement governing the use of the materials. In this case, the owner of the material the owner of the grapes or the owner of the olives will be able to claim compensation against the owner who made the wine or the olive oil for the value of the material. But the owner of the material cannot claim for the value of the thing that was created. However, if the new thing can be restored to its original form, then ownership vests in the owner of the material. Please see your study guide for examples. So let's deal with mingling and mixing. Now, what is mingling and mixing? It is where movable things belonging to different persons are mixed together without the consent of the owners and in such a way that the movables cannot be separated to its previous state or the parts individually identified. So the mixture then becomes the joint property of the former owners in proportion to the value of the things included in the mixture. So an example of mingling would be the mixing together of, of solid materials. For example, mixing together of grain or the mixing together of feathers. Confusio is the mixing together of liquid materials, for example, oil and wine. Now, another example of a method of originally acquiring ownership is that of a treasure trove. So where you find a treasure um, that is valuable, movable, corporeal things, and if it's hidden for so long that it is impossible de to determine the ownership, then the owner of the hidden treasure is um, ownership is acquired by either the landowner or by the accidental finder. The landowner and the accidental finder will become owners of the treasures in half shares. Physical control by the finder is required. OK, um, the next method of original acquisition that I will be discussing is expropriation. As you've seen, I've discussed it very briefly. 
Dr. Yes, Kibbe? Professor Knobel. It, I think yes, let me let me give you a chance to quickly take a sip of water because I think we are we are we can hear that your voice are, is is struggling a little bit. Let me give you a chance to just take a short break. Thank you so much, Prof. Thank you very much. Okay, so expropriation. Expropriation is also an example of an original, um, a method of original acquisition of ownership. Now, what does expropriation entail? It's where the state acquires ownership of a movable or an immovable thing without the consent of the owner. Remember, I've mentioned before that with original acquisition of ownership, there is no cooperation from the owner. Whereas in the case of derivative acquisition of ownership, there is cooperation with the, with the owner of the um, property. So remember, expropriation is where the state acquires ownership of a movable thing without the consent of the owner against payment of compensation. Now, Section 25 of the Constitution addresses land reform. And it specifies specific regulations and procedures addressing when and how land may be expropriated by the state. Now, an expropriation would be regarded as being valid if it is non-arbitrary, if it is in terms of a law of general application, if it is for a public purpose or in the public interest, and furthermore, it must be against compensation. Another means of acquiring ownership and another means of or an example of the original acquisition of ownership is where you obtain ownership by means of acquisitive prescription. So what does this entail? It's where a person who controls a thing openly and as if he or she were the owner for an uninterrupted continuous period of 30 years becomes its owner. Say, example, for example, you find an abandoned piece of land and the neighbouring land is also, for example, abandoned. And let's use the example of the servitude of right of way again. Um, say, for example, you use the right of way on the abandoned um, or you have property, your own property, and the neighbour's property is abandoned and you use a right of way over the neighbouring property to access various towns and you do so for a period of 30 years and no one has um, made any um, objections to you using the road then you will acquire ownership of that that um, or a limited real right, for example, over that farm for using the road for a period of, of, of 30 years that you can acquire a servitude in that regard as well. So that is what is meant by um, prescription um, for an uninterrupted continuous period of 30 years. Now, this isn't the only example. Please see your study guide for further examples of how you can acquire ownership by means of prescription. So after completion of the prescription period, and if all the requirements of prescription are met, then you become the owner of the thing, or in the case of the servitude, you become, you have obtained a limited real right um, with regard to the right of way. Now, it's important to note that the Prescription Act of 1969 applies to prescriptive periods beginning 1 December 1970, and prior to that, the Prescription Act of 1943 applies. Now, this is important if you receive a case study to distinguish which Act is applicable. Is it the Prescription Act of 1969 or is it the Prescription Act of 1943? So, so if you receive a case study, please take note of the date of when prescription starts to run. Now, the main difference between the two acts, the 1969 Act and the 1943 Act, lays in the definitions of the possession requirement and the temporal requirement. In the 1943 Act, acquisitive prescription requires possession without force, without secrecy, and without revocable permission, whilst the 1969 Act merely refers to possession as openly as if he were the owner. 
So the 1969 Act eliminates the terminology without force and replaces it with out with the, the terminology without revocable permission, as if he were the owner. The 1969 Act has also softened some of the stricter requirements about the continuity of possession by providing stricter rules as to the onset of suspension or the occurrence of interruption. Now, this is a, a table that, that highlights the, the difference between um, Section 2, Subsection 1 of the Prescription Act of 1943 and Section 1, of the Prescription Act 68 of 1969. Please read through it, the differences between the two. And with regard to the interruption of prescription, now prescription can be interrupted. In the case of interruption, the period of prescri prescription, which has already run, is terminated and the period of prescription must begin to run anew. Now, interruption can occur in two forms, namely natural interruption or judicial interruption. Let's take the example of the servitude again. Um, say, for example, you use the right of way over the abandoned land for a period of 20 years. And there's a natural interruption or judicial interruption that occurs in that 20 years. Then that means your prescription period will terminate and the period of prescription must begin to run anew before you can acquire ownership. Now, an example of the natural interruption of um, prescription is through voluntary loss of possession. Um, if the possessor waits too long before taking legal steps to regain his or her possession, if the situation involving an act of God prevents the possessor from regaining possession within 12 months, an example of judicial interruption occurs when legal proceedings such as a summons, a notice of motion are initiated by the true owner against the acquirer, wherein ownership is based on the return of ownership rather than on a claim for compensation for unlawful possession. So say, for example, you use the again with regard to the example of the right of way over the abandoned land, you use it for a period of, say, for example, 29 years and just after that 29 years, the true owner shows up and um, serves summons on you to um, inform you that he is the 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 um, the owner of the, um, the the land and that you are not allowed to to use the road, for example, then your 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 um, then prescription will be judicially interrupted. So the mere service of process does not permanently interrupt the course of prescription. <laughs> Interruption occurs only if the person who lays claim to ownership succeeds in carrying his or her claim to the final judgment. And then um, suspension of prescription. Suspension is the temporary suspension of a period of prescription. Here, the period which has already run does not lapse, but the course is suspended and can recommence at a later date. Suspension of the prescription period takes place in favor of a number of persons whom the law wants to protect by not allowing prescription to run against them. So these categories are, for example, minors, insane persons, married women with retention of the husband's marital power, persons absent from the country because of war, or those who are employed by the state, and then also fide commissaries. Um, to determine um, suspension please see um your study guide for the method of calculation and this concludes today's session if you have any questions regarding um the work that i've explained now please do not hesitate to send an email or um to um insert a, a question or comment in the chat box so thank you very much for your attention thank you to you dr kivitz thank you thank you um i've I took note of um, the concern in the chat that this is a mere repeat of the study guide. I think it is important for, for me to, um, to give some background to students who might not uh, think that this is this the type of, um, or the way that we are presenting these classes are not beneficial to them. I think it is important to to give you some kind of background. Uh, if you, um, yeah, let me start off by saying 
first semester we we deal with roughly 3000 students. Um, from what I can see, 26 students are now attending this class. Now, um, we have been doing these classes since uh, the pandemic started, so that means 2020. And um, yes, we, we've done many of these and we have sort of experienced and um, realized that students are not usually attending these, these things. OK, so that's the first thing. And um, then the way that we are doing this is. Our feedback from the majority of students was that that this is what they want. They want us to give information. They want to to be able to go and look at this again um, because they they prefer seeing the slides and hear somebody basically presenting it. So um, I have taken note. I saw that there's one student who, who particularly indicated his um, that he he doesn't find it beneficial to to him. Um, we will discuss um, the way forward in amongst us. I will speak to Dr. Kivitz and um, Mr. Kutu, and we can decide how we're going to proceed through the semester. For today, I want to um, from my side apologize. I was hoping that we can repeat the um the recording i i'm not all that smart with technology so from my side it worked they didn't work that way I, I will try to figure out why um but i think in the view of dr kiwitz not um feeling all that well today i think we're going to let the case the discussion of the two cases stand over for next week so what we will do next week is we will start with those two cases and um, then we're going to do study units um, five, six, and seven. Um, after next week's class, that will then conclude ownership. Um, so then we will would have been we we, we would have dealt with um, ownership as a concept, the limitation of ownership, original acquisition, derivative acquisition, um, protection of ownership, and termination, and also co-ownership. Now that is a mouthful. Um, so I will also post on my NISA. Um, yeah, I will. I will again emphasize the importance of preparing uh, because I think for protection of ownership, it it's really it really won't make sense to to not have um, an idea of the remedies that you can use to protect ownership. Um, so we will talk about um, the different remedies um, and also their purpose and so on. Um, that is a, a, a part of the work that is very important to understand um, and especially to to be able to distinguish between the remedies because they are very um, regularly asked as exam questions and they are um, um, we are, we can taste them very nicely in um, factual uh, questions and um, application question. So make sure to study that study unit um, before the class. OK, then. Um, OK, yeah, the, uh, to, to Luana, the cases that we will. Um, uh, Dr. Kiewicz was actually prepared. I just don't think it's fair um, to um, for her to to present them now. I think it's better next week. It's the um, Hendrix case, Hendrix versus Hendrix, and then it is the um, Bischoff versus Balba plan. So if you go and um, look in your 101, you will see there that they um, those cases are listed there. There are four cases that you must read yourself for this module. Uh, I think then just one or two things that I would like to highlight uh, after the um the discussion of study units three and four it's just things that i realize sometimes students um don't under understand maybe um remember that for this module we also explain that in the 101 tutorial letter um you you might have noticed that dr kiewitz did refer to certain um cases that are dealt with in the in the study guide for example she spoke um, of the mcdonald case um, Riedling Ice versus Bazoni, she referred to certain very important property law cases. 
Um, of course, we cannot expect you to read all those cases yourself. But what we do expect is that you know um, those cases to the extent that they are discussed in the study guide. Um, so certain for certain cases, we have uh, a short discussion of the essence of that case. Um, I don't want to repeat everything that I said last week about um, ethical behavior and about not just copying from the study guide. And yeah, I want to emphasize this. You need to find a way of, um, of, of reflecting and um, discussing those aspects of these cases. Um, for the exam, you cannot write, you cannot use your study guide, you cannot simply copy exact phrases from the study guide. You're not supposed to use your study guide. So you will have to find a way to, to, um, to discuss them and to um, refer to the essence of that case. The only parts of, of cases like that that we include in the study guide are really um, the most important aspect. Um, it, it really refers to the, the essence um, and, and, and basically the most important um, aspects. OK, so um, now I see there's a question about prescription. Uh, what if an owner of a land left a small space? I see it's Palesa's question. After a few years, decide to close the passage, but their neighbours refuse or do not want him or her to close it. Can the person close it as they are the rightful owner of the land and was doing this pathway vol voluntarily? Okay, Palesa, that question is um, kind of difficult to answer uh, sort of with, without having more facts, because it all depends on the nature of that passage. There are some case law about, um, especially in the Cape, where people were using, you know, a, row, a, a short pathway to reach the beach. Um, and the question also deals with, is it is it a public space or is it private land? So that would depend on many things. Um, I don't think that one... Is, is so clear cut, it would, it would depend on whether it was private land. And then even in a case like that, if it's something that was happening for many, many years, that um, you, it, it might not even be, be prescription, but it might be something else sort of, um, it, it might be because it, be, it basically became a, a public space, if I can put it like that. Um, but that Prof. that might not even be prescription, Mr. Kutu. Prof. Yeah, you know, I just want to try to answer uh, Palisa's question. Sure, thanks. For me, yeah, for me, the for me the way the question is structured, I will I will take prescription completely out of the picture. Why? Because the question says um, the person has been uh, using the road, and then suddenly the owner closes. It. So, like, let's say, if ever the uh, that uh, owner was not using that that property uh, for 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 more than six years. Then pre then uh, prescription does not come into play. Then there is certain uh, doctrine that one of um, way of necessity because uh, now uh, look uh, if the look if the neighbor wants to now um, negotiate for a right of way servitude. Like let's say you were using the property before, but suddenly um, the owner wants to you know, like close that road, then you have an option. Either you negotiate for uh, a, a, a right of way servitude. Now, if ever there is no, look, if ever there's no agreement and you know that this is the only way that I can use to to uh, to get to the uh, nearest public road, then you find uh, the term is called hemmed. So if your property is hemmed, that you cannot pass to the other side without passing here, and then there's no any other way. Then you apply that uh, doctrine of, uh, it's called way of necessity. But I think it can be discussed uh, when you're dealing with civil. Yeah, I, I also think we can um, uh, talk about that and about the way of necessity. But uh, Palisa, that is a, a very interesting question. It's, it's um, one that we don't deal in that much detail in the module itself. But it is um, 
it is a very interesting uh, aspect. And and as I said, it's it's sort of a multidimensional thing because it 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 depends on many things on on the nature of you know the area and and things like that. But there are very interesting case law there. If you are interested, you you can ask me and I can um, I can try to find some of those cases and I can send it to you. Um, colle uh, colleagues, I don't know whether you want to add something else. I don't see another question in the chat. Um, so I will, I, last week we did get the request to to try to have the um, these discussions um, on the same time, on the same day. It works well for me on a Thursday at 10. Um, what I'm going to try to do is to always do it like this. Um, we might change the format. format. I, as I said, I will talk to my colleagues. Um, of course, if we have some kind of official um, other engagement, we will not be able to 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 do this class at 10. For example, Mr. Kutu is actually attending and something else, but he did join now, for which I'm very thankful. Dr. Kiewitz, I want to thank you for um, presenting for us, even though um, you are not feeling that well. Um, and um, and yes, I think that concludes it. Uh, students, um, I did get a few requests from students who were not able to access or to submit their first assignments. Um, I'm going to deal with those, uh, yeah, with those few students individually. But what I want to, um, I want you to keep an eye on my UNISA because I will post something um, officially there as well. If we are going to open the link for those students to submit, I will post an announcement. And what um, if you then would like to resubmit? Because remember, as I said last week, you do have two opportunities. Um, the purpose is not for you to wait for your result. It's just to replace your document if you think that you can improve or if you accidentally submitted the wrong document. Um, as I said, please remember, we cannot um, open an assignment and then contact each student to resubmit. We have our numbers are too high. So if you um, if I tell you that the link have been reopened, Use the opportunity to replace your assignment if you want to. Uh, that will, uh, yeah, no, nobody wants to get a zero mark because um, you or she accidentally submitted the wrong file. I'm not saying the wrong module or something like that. Make, make sure that you submit what you want us to mark. That's what it comes down to. Then I received quite a lot of, of queries about assignment two. Assignment two is a quiz, a quiz assessment. Um, so it's multiple choice questions, but it is a combination of straightforward questions, but also um, application questions. It's going to deal with all the work. So I really um, don't want you to underestimate the quiz. Um, it's, it's, it's not just a, a straightforward, very easy, assignment. I want you to um, consider this as a revision exercise. For that reason, we're only going to open it by the end of September. But um, yes, don't just, um, you, once again, you will have two attempts. And in this case, you will see your result immediately. So if you do the quiz, it's going to give you a result. If you are not happy with that result, you can retake the assessment and the best mark will be added um, to your to your semester mark. But I will share the dates, but um, it is end of September. Okay, it's going to open at the end of September. Uh, so I think that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Kutu, for joining. Thank you, Dr. Kiewitz, for presenting, despite not um, feeling great. And thank you for those of you who attended. And we will... Um, uh, uh, much much Satsi, two it seems. Okay, the the recording um Mawandi will be you will see on the My Unisa module site. I've created a folder. If you look to the left of your screen on My Unisa, I've created a folder where I'm posting all the links for the recordings and all the PowerPoint um 
presentations and everything I, I will post there. Um, so it's if you yeah just just look um yeah on, on if if you open the module side to the, on the left side left hand side you will see a folder there. So I think um, yeah that's it for today. And once again, students, please accept my apology for not being technologically advanced um, as much as I want to. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye, colleagues. Bye, students.